you all. It's a pleasure to be sharing this space again with you. On behalf of the Director General, I give you a very well warm, warm welcome to this second webinar held uh, jointly by the CARICOM Secretariat, the Inter-American Children's Institute Specialized Body from the Organization of American States, the NGO Caribbean Development Foundation, and the multinational office of UNICEF based in Barbados. This morning, we have the honor to count with uh, Dr. Tamu Davidson from CARFA, Ms. Faith Marshall Harris from member of the Committee of the Rights of the Child and Magister Daniel Claverie, consultor of the IIM. We will be sharing this space with you on mental health, child, children and adolescents rights. Please bear in mind that you may be able to make questions via the chat tool and also with the question and uh, answer tool on the base of your screen. So with this brief presentation, uh, Dr. Tamu Davidson is the first head of the Chronic Disease and Injury Department at the Caribbean Public Health Agency, CARFA. She has regional responsibility for the nutrition and the prevention of and control of non-communicable diseases, including mental health and injuries. Before joining CARFA, Dr. Davidson worked as medical doctor and public health specialist for a combined 24 years in both urban and rural Jamaica at every level of the health system. She has held several positions, including physician, research, assistant, cycle cell unit, district medical officer, HIV AIDS support group facilitator, medical officer of health, regional HIV AIDS STI program coordinator, acting regional technical director, medical epidemi epidemiologist, chronic diseases and injuries, and director disease prevention and control. Her career in public spans several public health programs in the area of adolescent health, surveillance, disaster management, HIV, AIDS, AIDS, STI, tobacco control, and NCDs. Dr. Davidson also taught epidemiology and non-communicable diseases in the Master of Public Health program at the University of Technology School of Public Health and Health Technology. It's an honor to have you this morning with us. You have the floor. Your microphone, Dr. Davidson, please. Sorry, thank you. All right, can you see my screen? I'm going to go into presentation mode. All right, good morning, everyone. So this morning, I'll be looking at um, what is mental health, um, looking at the arrival of COVID-19 pandemic. We'll be looking at before COVID-19, what is the COVID-19 effect, and some of the common signs and symptoms of stress in children and adolescents and what can be done. Um, as I look today at the topic, the topic today uh, we'll be looking at is mental health in children and adolescents. So what is mental health? And mental health is a state of mental well-being um, where people um, can cope well with many of the stressors of, of life and can realize their own potential and can function productively and fruitfully and are able to contribute to their communities. Sorry, I'm having... So what of mental health in childhood? Um, and really mental health disorders in child children are generally um, defined as delays or disruptions in developing age-appropriate thinking behaviors social skills or regulation of their emotions. So as everyone is aware, we had the arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've never seen anything like this before and experienced anything like this before, at least in recent times. The last pandemic, the pandemic was in the 1900s, early 1900s. And so on March, the 11th of March, the Director General of WHO declared the outbreak of a novel coronavirus, COVID-19, as a pandemic. And as of July, globally, we have had over 11 million cases confirmed and over half a million deaths. 
And in the Caribbean, we have over 60,000 confirmed cases and 1,340 deaths. So this was really a major, major and sudden change in what we know to be um, the world today. So before COVID-19, um, mental health um, problems affected adolescents and children. Uh, mental health disorders of children were and is a major public health issue. About half of mental health conditions show up by the age of 14 years old, and about 10 to 20 percent of children and adolescents had a mental health problem globally. Some of the common conditions they face include anxiety disorders, eating disorders, depression, substance use disorders, and attention deficit hyperactive disorders. And these are just some. So before COVID, this was already a problem that we faced. Arrival of the COVID pandemic, this really caused the suddenness of disruption of the status quo. A new normal, which is often referred to, um, you know, it, with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so we had isolation, quarantine, restriction of travel and movement. Um, we were uncertain of who would get it, when it would strike, um, a lot of uncertainty as to when the restrictions would be lifted and when usual activities would be resumed. There was also confusion because of developing understanding of where the virus impact works and therefore how to respond to it. Um, there was a feeling of hopelessness, loss of reduction of personal control of freedom. And these are just some of the gaps of, of um, ranges of um, feelings and perceptions um, that we have been going through um, since this pandemic was declared. So what is the COVID effect on children and adolescents? There are so many, and there are several. And so um, here I highlight some of those that are directly affecting adolescents. They're unable, and children are unable to go to school. They have to adapt a whole new way of learning. Um, there are limitations of online schooling, and some are accessing no schooling. Um, they're not able to see their friends, their beloved family members, caregivers, and um, especially for those with disabilities because of the social and physical distancing, the need to become stay separate in order to prevent transmission of the COVID-19 infection. Um, they're no longer to move around freely, um, especially outdoors. They can't go to events, eating and shopping. There's sometimes not enough food. So many children relied on their main meal when they went to school. And this was their most nutritional and unhealthy meal. And so by not going to school, um, they did not have access to these foods. Um, little physical and the risk of gaining weight. And many may be living in very cramped spaces. And, um, and there's a competition for space because the family is at home and parents are at home working from home. Um, and most importantly, also there's an increased risk of family dysfunction, violent behavior, witnessing abuse um, within the family setting, being a victim of, of abuse, being abused by caregivers. Um, also, if there's a death or illness of a family member from COVID-19, there's, there's no opportunity to grieve or say goodbye. And then there's the issue of stigma and discrimination. Um, families, unemployment, underemployment. Um, no internet access or poor internet access to really have access and interaction with, with the outside world. Um, disruption of services, especially for children who have disabilities, who have chronic illnesses, um, are not able to access to services, um, children with mental health conditions, and also parents not coping um, or having their own mental health issues and trying to deal with this new, what we describe as a new normal. So this is just the same thing, uh, information, but looking at it from the dimensions of wellness, covering both the emotional, physical, financial, and intellectual. So this interaction with direct impact on children and also their surrounding environment is causing what I, what I coined as the 
COVID effect. So this COVID effect impacts both on children and adolescents who, who were developing normally, did not have any mental health problems. And during COVID-19, they may be less able to cope with these various stressors that are coming to them um, at all levels and multiple stressors. So the list I presented was not exhaustive, but really tells us what the multiple dynamics of these stressors that they're having to deal with the, the, on a daily basis. Um, and for those with existing mental health conditions, there's exacerbation of these conditions because of the stressors. And also there's um, disruption um, of access to services. And I just want to also mention here, um, also for, for children with disabilities um, as well. Uh, this is a major issue. So what are some of the signs and symptoms of stress in children and adolescents? And this is not exhaustive, but these are some of the common things. Um, poor, perform, poor performance in, in, in school work, um, withdrawal and isolation, um, difficulty concentrating, um, increased worries and inability to focus. Um, very often we may complain of um, physical symptoms, the tummy aches, the headaches, the aches and pains. Um, they may not be sleeping well, they may not be sleeping uh, much, or they may be sleeping too much. Um, nightmares is another thing, problems with their appetite as well. And those, um, some of the behaviors, they begin to revert to behaviors that they had at a younger age, um, like bedwetting, um, throwing tantrums, becoming very clingy. And sometimes they display aggressive behaviors, um, irritability, and also um, more so with um, the older adolescent. Um, in those years, they tend to take a risk, a lot of risk behaviors. For example, not really caring much for their own safety, physical alterations, um, on use, using unsafe items, lighting matches, um, use substance use as well, um, smoking and, and alcohol use. So these are just some of the signs and symptoms of, of, of um, stress in children and adolescents. So I'm sharing here um, a study that was reported on, um, and this was in Italy and Spain, where they looked at parents' reports of children's difficulty during COVID-19 confinement. And we see here that um, the, the, the largest um, the difficulty was difficulty concentrating, and that was followed by um, irritability and restlessness and nervousness, and also feeling um, a sense of loneliness. So these are some of the um, effects of the confinement due to COVID-19 on children. So what can be done? Um, certainly healthcare professionals, uh, sorry, um, governments um, can integrate and should integrate mental health and psychosocial support interventions for children in their national plans. And that should not be limited to just the health sector, but right across all sectors. Um, they need, there's a need to ensure that mental health services are part of the essential services and include innovative ways in delivering these services through um, teleconsultations, um, through phone services, um, and um, through community outreach as well, um, with taking into consideration the need to that um, healthcare personnel need to have the correct um, personal protective um, care. Um, and we need to also implement protective measures to reduce risk factors for health, mental health problems and um, for persons with mental health conditions. So we need to ensure that um, the children are protected and adolescents um, and um, we provide a supportive environment. Um, public education to raise awareness about this public health issue and also the need to really communicate messages that really promote and support mental health and well-being. Um, for civil society, these are just some um, key areas that could be addressed. And this is really advocacy, bringing um, to the forefront the issue of this area of um, addressing mental health issues.
for children and adolescents and ensuring that this is done within the context of a human rights framework. Um, providing supportive care for children and adolescents, um, such as probably as basic as helping to facilitate um, access to foods, um, helping to facilitate access to medicines um, and other social services, and also promoting some support for parents and caregivers who are under a lot of stress themselves. Um, for health professionals, it's important that um, health professionals are able to identify these problems and treat appropriately and early, and to provide support um, for parents and caregivers who are essentially uh, the first line response for children and adults. Teachers and educators can further as aid in providing um, supportive environment and working with families and healthcare professionals if they identify concerns about or identify signs of stress in children in that are in school. With respect to parents and caregivers, um, it's important that they practice self-care because they themselves are the first line of response for children and adolescents. And um, they need to ensure that they're able to support um, their children through this process by also looking out for signs and symptoms um, of stress, um, talking with children and creating really schedules and routines and ensuring they're monitoring how much of this information they're exposed to. Um, so it's important if uh, the parent or caregiver is really under stress or feeling that they're not coping really to seek help. And so these are some critical areas. I just want to then highlight that really the failure to address mental health problems in children and adolescents can have long lasting effects beyond childhood and adolescence. And I'd like to share with you a quote, a voice, voice from a child of a child. And this is Abigail Alcock, she's 10 years old. And I must disclaim, this is my niece sharing her views. Um, and she says, I'm not, I'm not scared if I stay at home, it cannot get me. I like staying at home, I have an excuse for everything. I do not want to do it. So it's not all um, necessarily um, a negative impact um, of COVID-19 on mental health and well-being. It can also be a um, positive impact because many parents um, and families may have gotten closer and are able to share more family time and get to know their children uh, much better. So there are some positive spin-offs spin -off from this COVID-19 in terms of um, families becoming closer together and the mental health and well-being of children and adolescents. But we have to overall look out for these stressors and signs and symptoms. And I'd just like to um, share with you, you know, what is important is that we need to work and respond as with all, every single sector on deck and on board in this response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. David Son. This uh, was a very interesting uh, position. Um, I, I want to highlight some important things that you said, beginning with uh, the feeling of the person, the loss of personal control of freedom. Uh, this is something that we have been also seeing in other uh, states and in other regions of the Americas. And it's uh, one of the biggest stressors that we have been seeing all around even before the arrival of COVID-19, children feel that they don't have a voice and that they don't have control of their lives. And obviously what the effects of the lockdown and all the things that you mentioned, they, it does has a directly affection to their everyday lives with the closing of schools. And uh, we see it when they perform poorly in school and they have less control as they themselves say. Um, the, the things that can be done uh, among the many that you mentioned, I would like to highlight that uh, the summary of it is uh, more comprehensive public policies regarding mental health and how they are addressed. 
in yeah. school, in the community, within families, and all the support that families need. And finally, and it has relation with what children have stated before about losing their personal freedom, is the importance of intergenerational dialogue between the children and their families and communities where they are developing their lives, not only regarding the COVID-19 issues that we have been seeing, yeah. but also uh, with yeah. all the personal stuff that uh, worries children and adolescents. Many thanks, Dr. Davidson. Now I want to introduce Ms. Faith Marshall Harris. She is a member of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child for the period 2019-2023. As an attorney at law specialized in family law, she is a former magistrate proceeding over the juvenile court from 2006 to 2012. And since 2012, she has been a UNICEF children's champion, lecturing on child rights to various sectors of the community, including doctors, nurses, teachers, social workers, parents and children, and she's currently also chairing the National Committee Monitoring the Rights of the Child of Barbados. Ms. Marshall Harris, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, my perspective is one where I'm saying that the mental health and wellness of every child is a right. That is, that they have established based on our convention rights to the child that every child and every young person has a right to the best possible health attainable. I'm going to amplify that. Now, um, my introduction here may not be necessary for many in the audience since they would know most about the right-based approach, but I thought that I should give you a bit of information on on this for those who are not familiar with the rights issue. The United Nations Convention on Rights of the Child dates back to 1990 and is the most ratified of all the UN conventions. And at the last count, uh, by, ratified by 197 countries, which is almost every country in the world. And it sets out children's rights in 54 articles based on four pillars or guiding principles. <clears throat> and these general guiding principles are non-discrimination, the best interest of the child, survival and development, and respect for the views of the child. The convention established that the rights of all persons under the age of 18, which is the definition we have for a child and young person. And under that treaty, a panel of 18 global experts are elected by all the countries who have ratified the convention. And we are known as the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, and I'm a member of that committee. And, and for obvious reasons, I focus a great deal on what happens in the Caribbean and the, the Americas, uh, because that, of course, is the region that I am more closely aligned to geographically, but our remit is actually global. This committee of experts um, interprets the articles of the convention through a number of general comments, which are constantly updated by us. And these seek to act as a guide to the 54 articles to explain and expand them further. And for the purposes of this discussion, I will focus on Article 24, which I think most of you know is the article that um, proclaims the child's right to, to health in stringent standards. It states that um, the state must recognize the right of the child to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health and to facilities for the treatment of illness and rehabilitation of health. It also stipulates that the state shall strive to ensure that no child is deprived of his or her right of access to health services. The, and also I'm going to make some reference to Article 23 because I think it has some relevance here. 
and it imposes specific obligations on states to take special measures of protection and provision in relation to disabled children, including mental health services. Um, it says also that we rec that states parties must recognize that a mentally or physically disabled child should enjoy a full and decent life in conditions which ensure dignity, promote self-reliance and facilitate the child's active participation in the community. The, both articles that I referred to go on to enumerate detailed ways in which countries to the parties to the convention must meet their health care obligations to children. And um, as I mentioned earlier, these obligations um, in relation to child and adolescent mental health also requires that certain um, obligations on the part of not only the state health service, but health professionals, policymakers. Now, we require that you also consider our general comments. The way the committee works is that the general comments, which I mentioned are always updated, are published. And in this regard, my reference points for this, but we have many, many um, general comments, but for this specific uh, area that we're discussing, um, I will be looking specifically at the general comments number four, number 15, and number 20. Now, the committee is responsible for the convention's enforcement. We review um, each state party's reports. They're required to report to us every five years. And um, after each review, we also issue um, concluding observations. The, our job, and it's the main job we have, is that we're going to look at the performance of each country in upholding and guaranteeing children's rights. And the concluding observations indicate the strengths and weaknesses that we perceive, point the way forward, we offer advice and recommendations for better outcomes. Now, in terms of the particular instance here now of COVID-19, we, in that framework, we recognize that the mental health of children would have been impacted quite severely by, as was mentioned in the first um, presentation, by the conditions of lockdown. Um, just specifically, we noted that the, um, they suffered probably the frustration of adults who found that the children were constantly underfoot, they were restless, their natural energy and curiosity could find little outlet and it was, and it was not properly appreciated that they need creative pursuits as well as physical exercise to remain mentally healthy. In fact, many of the protocols mandated for the containment of COVID-19 meant that they could not go outside to play, which is in fact, another requirement under the rights of the child. And many adults complained bitterly if children sought to find respite and several were severely punished as a result. We did see an increase in some countries in terms of violence against children, that is corporal punishment, which I think mental health is affected by corporal punishment, especially where they're perceived as totally unjust. Um, the, where um, the use of corporal punishment is stimulate, which it, we know it does stimulate fear and enmity against adults because it's seen as an injustice in that it's a crime to assault an adult. However, adults are free to assault children without any um, punishment. And in, unfortunately in our region, this is sometimes supported as being a cultural norm. That has had an effect on the mental health of children. Also, the inability not to express themselves on these issues, which in parts of our region is curtailed and not, and you know, to be seen and not heard. And in fact, if we are to deal with the mental health of children, we are going to have to pay due regard to the fact that they need to be able to express their hurt, their pain, whatever troubles them. Um, 
No, I have focused quite a lot of adolescents, which I think in terms of the time I have available to me, I will not be able to do much. But the committee has focused a great deal in terms of its mental health strategies on adolescents in particular, because we have found in our studies that adolescents um, are the ones who feature mainly in our reports as the ones who are prone to showing signs leading to health, self-harm and suicide. We felt that they are not listened to sufficiently and that they ought really to have a say in their, their, their um, health care in accordance with their evolving capacity. In fact, we are in, we are in, this is not just regionally, but globally, we are concerned about the increase in mental health Ill health among adolescents, and this was even before COVID-19, which would have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 conditions. <clears throat> and that the, as, as you are aware, um, adolescents are in particular have a strong urge to socialize with their peers, and which COVID-19 prevented, and you know, which brought in social distancing. They were left to use their devices, which in itself can exacerbate their own feelings of uh, inferiority. Um, many of them suffered problems there. What can be done? And because I believe my time is running out, what can be done um, in all of this? The one of the recommendations is that we state parties must pay more attention to the voice of adolescents that they must endeavor to find strategies that involve their safe places. Very often the safe space was at school, but the schools are now not open. And so the, in the terms of the community, we're going to have to create the spaces for them to be heard, to participate in strategies that will bring them back to good health. We also need to um, pay far more attention to what happens with them online and to make the digital space more secure. They obviously their freedom to associate, which is another right they have, was curtailed by COVID-19. But as we come out of lockdown, more attention's got to be paid to, to that um, to their ability to associate freely and speak out. The, Adolescent in particular needs the attention to ensure that they can get treatment and rehabilitation from mental disorders. And that the community, we must make sure the community is aware of the early signs and symptoms and the seriousness of these conditions to protect them from undue pressures, including psychosocial stress. We, we urge states to combat discrimination and stigma surrounding mental disorders, include in line with their obligation on the article two, and that we want to, them to recognize that every adolescent with a mental disorder has the right to be treated and cared for as far as possible in the community in which he or she lives, and where hospitalization or placement in a psychiatric institution is necessary, this decision should be made in accordance with the principle of the best interest of the child and the views of the child, and that there should not be an over-reliance on medication. Um, I think that um, we want to make sure we create a safe and supportive environment for adolescents, including within the family, within the school, where it is now possible, when it becomes possible. And finally, we want to ensure that whatever we do, it is child-centric interventions, which will build resiliency and autonomy and place young people challenged by mental ill health on a solid path of recovery. Many thanks, Ms. Marshall Harris. Definitely uh, interesting information regarding on um, the international tools that we have to keep mental health as a right, as stated in, in the articles 24, 23 that you mentioned. And uh, I want to highlight uh, two things that I consider very important to take into account on the work we do on promotion and protection of the rights of children and adolescents. And, one of them is, uh, again, the importance of the voice of children and adolescents, that they feel that they are seen but not heard. And their, their call, they, their, it's 
for us to listen to what they are going through so they can uh, be taken into account and how this would lower the stressors of their mental health and also the importance of comprehensive public policies that uh, Dr. Tamu Davidson also mentioned. Uh, the attention of the voice of adolescents is very important and it's a priority during these hard moments and this was also a problem before COVID-19 so now we can take it as an opportunity to make adolescents be heard and seen. And the second point is the importance of being corporal punishment and some stressor of mental health. Not only the exposure to violence, but how this violence also opens a path of no return to children and adolescents who suffer it and how we need to advocacy to make this visible and end corporal punishment as a way of discipline and focus more on positive discipline and other ways of making limits and caring children and adolescents through life but with uh, care and love. Thank you very much, Ms. Marshall Harris, for uh, your, your statement. Uh, please remember that you may be able to make questions on the chat tool and on the question and answer tool on the lower base of your screen. And for the people following us on Facebook, you may comment the video to uh, make your questions. Uh, now we give the floor to uh, Magister Daniel Claverie. He's, he has a master a degree on psychology. He has a master degree on public policies and rights of children and adolescents. He has been working for the IIN for five years now as a rights restitution consultant but he has also experience in public policy working for the Social Development Ministry of Uruguay. Daniel, you have the floor. Okay. Um, well, first, I want to say that it's a pleasure for me to be part of this virtual table with this important colleagues. And also, it's nice to be arriving to the Caribbean now, uh, at least with my voice, because here in the South America, it's very freeze. So uh, this is the first two things. I'm gonna share a PowerPoint to guide my presentation. And in the meantime, I can say that some concepts are aligned to the TAMU presentation. So take, if I, I will try not to repeat, but if I repeat some concepts is take it like a, a confirmation or affirmation of an idea. Okay, my presentation uh, has two parts. The first part, uh, I will try to put in question the name of pandemic, you, you will see. And then the other second part, uh, I will try to uh, talk about the negative effects and not only negative effects of this moment, because as Tamu said also, uh, not all is catastrophic, but could be in some uh, situations. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, as I said, uh, I wanna say that if we put children in the center of this situation, talking about rights, we can say that children were and are in a pandemic, an historical pandemic. Why? Because you can take and check uh, the indicator you want in America, in the world, and you can see that there's massive negative effects of the adult-centric uh, way of life right now that are uh, uh, making negative effects to children. Only just to be, to be fast with this, but to confirm this affirmation, if we, there's some studies that uh, present the infanticide practices like three or four centuries ago, the massive child labor problem we still have, but in another time was uh, much more. Uh, as both uh, the colleagues said, the children and the exercise of the right to participate was and is already now 
a big, big problem. The, the, the difficult for children to organize, to put their voice, their feelings in the agenda, in the public and social agenda, that's still a big, big pandemic. I could say like that, because it's massive, the negative effect to a massive uh, population. Uh, as I said, different kind of violence. If you see the indicators, indicators of neonatal mortality, child poverty, child mortality, stunt growth. And if you check indicators, I'm not going to say the numbers now. You can check if you check indicators of um, adolescents disappearing in some countries of America, the child and adolescent involved in uh, crime, in organized crime. Uh, well, there's a lot of problems going on that I can say, I want to say that it's also a pandemic that we are still living. Why I'm saying this? Well, just to finish this concept, there's indicators that tell us uh, data in millions of children, as UNICEF told us, to, to, to prevent what could happen until the year 2030. Look, 167 million children will be in extreme poverty. You know what extreme poverty means? Uh, means a vital or a life project uh, down, broke down. Uh, 69 million children, and they, we are talking in millions also, the, the negative effect under age of five will die between, well, until 2030. Uh, 60 million children of primary school age will be out of school. The same, if it's, it's not a pandemic, what it is. So you may wonder, I do wonder why the planet didn't mobilize as now in order to protect massive impact to children. Why certain damage have not been and are not a global priority. Okay. Now on this part, I'm gonna talk about the, what is to live in this traumatic situation because this uh, situation now, the, the was a very quick change of the daily routine life, the access to services, different things that very quick changed and that's the big problem. When something changes very quick, the uh, we is gonna be always gonna be some effects, not always negative, but effects that we have to recognize to respond well. Um, what I'm gonna put it in losses, gains, and challenges. The losses. I'm gonna, just gonna read it because we know what. Uh, the losses are, and also Tamu talk about that. Well, the access to basic services like health control, education, alimentation, recreation, the institutional and com community spaces and reference, some of them, some of these reference are the most protectors, actors, or actresses in the comprehensive protection system for children. That's a big point. Well, the losses of family and friends, material bonds, the contact with their peers, that is very, very important. The daily routine, the playtime, and some kind of time that cannot be done in this time, the mother nature daily contact, the stable environment. Talking about social uh, things that are moving and arrive sometimes with uh, non dosificate information to children and adolescents, and that is a big problem because uh, depends on depends on the age of the child or adolescent to see in the news that people are dying in some place in the world uh, or the infected of the the impact to uh, of grows uh, people to the the um, grandpa or grandmother that arrive to children and make effects. And also the environment that change if some family employment situation are going on. Negative effects, Tamu already told, 
talk about that. The isolation or loneliness feeling, uh, the stress uh, when more prolonged, more toxic. And when we talk about toxic stress, that is uh, a concept that goes directly to uh, difficult in uh, a healthy grow of children. The high rights, rates of boredom, the children are in some situation are being getting bored, bored very uh, much more than than usually, and this is a concept that is use is being used used sorry now, uh, talking about the more ex exposition to screen, more hours of the screen, uh, in the case of class, virtual class or games, and this is uh, a big change that also uh, make children have this kind of, of uh, effects. Uh, also may appear irritability, anxiety, restlessness, fear of own and loved one illnesses. The gains. Uh, gains is what, uh, what is new, sometimes could be, can be uh, positive, maybe negative. It's a big question mark because of this, because it uh, depends on the material and emotional condition of house, home, and family. The best scenario, the positive gains, well, uh, also to, could be a nice scenario to enrich bond with parents, to have more creative and particip participative new home organization. The parents and the children can talk more, uh, think more about how to reorganize routines, uh, could be more intergenerational playtime. Uh, well, in the best cases, if the conditions and the devices allow, the virtual education could be uh, another situation to make parents content and go uh, help and talk more about different topics with children, but the worst scenario uh, is something that not, not arrived now. If there's an increase of violent situation, uh, we can say that maybe, or mostly I can, I can assure that the violent situation were before the pandemic. So now if we couldn't as a comprehensive protection system arrive in time to protect, to prevent. In this scenario, this is going to be worst. Uh, in many cases, children passed, could pass to live all day with the aggressors um, and without having contact with the community, with the, the teacher, with the uh, people in the outside world of the limited home, uh, could be an isolation, a very difficult uh, to, to ask for help. No reference, as I said, nobody to ask for help. The poverty condition, the lack of food, many services uh, give daily food for children that now they are not allowed to have it daily. The lack of clear information, as I said, that's a big point. We have, we, we have to know that children uh, could say that everything's okay, but the information is arriving to them and we need to be there to understand, to, to listen to what is, what they are understanding, what are feeling. And well, it's like to, to work together, to content that. Uh, and we need for that, we need prepare parents or adults and if we don't have that, we need uh, public policies arriving to enforce families. This was a need before the pandemic. Now it's much more again. Okay. Daniel, uh, you well, have two minutes to go. Okay, I have only one slide. Now the challenge, I wanna divide the challenge in two for this presentation. Uh, the challenge for public policy, as I said, and the family. The public policy is to know 
and I'm talking in, a, in general in a big, every institution of the comprehensive protection system. Uh, the challenge is to know exactly what is happening at every home from any actor or actress uh, or local ter territorial service. I mean, I don't care if, it's, if it is a teacher, a doctor, an educator, a social worker, a reference from the near, nearby NGO, a leader in the community, but we need to arrive in a virtual way or in a material way to know what is happening. Because if I uh, let in isolation uh, different uh, vulna vulnerability uh, situation will be very difficult for to front, to face. And the challenge to finish for the family is to, to face the situation without hiding children and adolescents the difficult of the situation. Uh, and that, that is easy to say, but difficult to, to do, to, to give, the, to enable the possibility, possibility to talk about the difficult of this situation, the changes, the in unstable environment as I talk. Uh, another challenge is open participation spaces to listen and to be all part of the new family organization. This spaces to talk, to understand together, recognize children and adolescent capacity to face and to propose alternatives. That's participate, be part of this moment, suffer and create alternatives, allow and be able to share and receive the fear and then and the uncertainty of the moment. And the last thing, this means to build together a new narrative of the situation. The inability to make sense of a potentially traumatic situation could cause a personal breakdown. I hope to, that, uh, to be very clear and thanks very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. Very interesting information provided. And also, uh, I would like to highlight uh, the idea of taking violence as a pandemic. Uh, this idea of children being exposed permanently to a historic pandemic regarding the violence, I think it's uh, something that we should have in mind. And uh, it's a very, uh, a very, uh, critic idea to take into account to make violence a specific problem that it's affecting children way before COVID-19. So I, I, I think that, that that idea, it's really uh, powerful to, to keep the work going on regarding uh, children and adolescents' rights and well-being. Also, again, the idea of uh, comprehensive public policies, the comprehensiveness of the public policies are the ones that will target effectively what children and adolescents are needing in terms of the coverage of their mental health, their health in general, the schooling and the environment where they are growing up. That also, um, <clears throat> takes me to what Ms. Uh, Faith Marshall Harris mentioned and the child focus that every public policy needs to have in order to build a society which takes in account children and adolescent voices. That uh, Danielle also mentioned as the opportunity to uh, start writing a new narrative for children and adolescents life. Uh, thank you very much, Danielle, for, for your words. Now we have some questions that uh, I would like to uh, make to our speakers today. The first one is uh, some adult, this is a question for uh, Dr. Tamu Davidson. Some adults do not recognize that children are very stressed and distressed by separation from their friends and their grandparents. What are some of the ways apart from the media campaigns that can, we can teach parents and teachers to recognize when the child needs a mental intervention? Okay, thank you. So some of the, the basic things and I think it's important that we, as a part of 
teaching the parents and caregivers. We need to, to recognize some of these signs and symptoms, as mentioned earlier, um, in, in children. And so this means that we have to, at all levels, so within, if the child is within the school setting, child in the home setting, the caregivers, different family members who support the child's care, we need to be able to educate them to recognize these signs and symptoms. It's, that's going to be one of the most important things that, that you're going to be able to do in order to recognize that the child is having a, having a challenge. Outside of that, um, is to ensure to um, engage the child um, in a setting, respond to their needs, talk about um, you know, COVID, try to find, get them to share some of their feelings. But it's going to be important for everyone to at least to have an understand that the child is not just being bad um, when you see them being more irritable, bedwetting, or clinging, but these may be signs of stress and that the child may not be coping and to speak to them. So I think that, that that's going to be the most one of the most important things. And remember that each child responds to stress differently and um, their signs. These are just some of the signs that I shared, but they may vary from child to child. And some, some may cope. So even in a household, you may have three children, and all of them are responding and coping in different ways to the stressors. Thank you, Dr. Davidson. We have another question. These ones for the three of you. What roles do adolescents have in helping their peers with the stress of COVID-19 period? I, I don't know who wants to go first. Um, Ms. Marshall Harris, please, you have the floor. Um, I was thinking, actually, adolescents, have, um, as you've seen in recent days, have, have been displaying great leadership on a number of topics, well, we know most significantly in climate change, but I think that we can tap into that uh, leadership that you're seeing adolescents display. And therefore, I think they should be encouraged to associate, know that they can associate and talk to each other. Because in fact, you know, there is a generational divide, which is very glaring at the moment because we're doing more, we're more online and that is where they excel. And in fact, I think they should be encouraged to interface in that space with each other, but in a more positive way than they're possibly doing at the moment. And I think that in fact, this is where they can shine and um, display tremendous leadership. Actually, I've seen it at work already here in Barbados, and I think that um, we should encourage it more. Talking to each other is really what I'm recommending. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if uh, Dr. Tamu Daniel, would you like to uh, also uh, uh, help support the answer? Daniel? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, um, I think that the, the concept of make a new narrative is also uh, can, can be used for this question. I mean, the, the children live, have a uh, uh, daily contact and relation with their peers, and that is so necessarily. And they can identify, they can uh, change, exchange in a different way, uh, different situations that are feeling, are living, are uh, fearing also. So the narrative of life is with all the relations we have. So we we need to ask. Adult, adult, we need to, to enable the, the time to talk, to speak, to exchange, but also the time to allow the children to have time with their peers. That is, that is very, very important. And uh, finally, uh, it's happen, happening sometimes that the, this re, quick reorganization of virtual classes were so uh, centered in the in the topic of the class and not in the situation that is very very necessary to have contact to to relate to have free time in a in a in a relation with the educational moment and uh, 
that's something that we have to to take in consideration. That also the institution is a a, a place where these fears, daily contact happens, and we need to uh, promote that too. Dr. Davidson. Yes, so I just want to, um, you know, confer, follow on just to say, as a part of their own mental health and well-being, I think it's important that we do encourage adolescents to converse with their peers. And even outside of our encouragement, naturally, um, adolescents are sharing what's going on on a day-to-day basis and coming up with their own solution, their own interpretation of what is actually happening. And it's important we're able to talk or facilitate that. And um, also engage them or encourage them to look at ways in which they can help to assist um, you know, in the response to the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. There, there are many stories of adolescents um, coming together either to um, put together meals for people who are less fortunate, who are not able to access food, um, who are going out um, and, and, and helping um, to deliver these meals, or just to um, write, you know, to um, all the adults who are in um, nursing homes or homes of care, there are many stories where, um, in fact, these old adults are conversing um, with adolescents, and some of this is driven by adolescents and people. And I just want to reiterate what was said early on by Mrs. Marshall Harris about the need for adolescents to have a voice in developing the response and in being part of the conversation. Adolescents and most children. Thank you very much. This one is also for the three of you. How can we educate parents that their own parenting styles have impact on their children? On their children. How can we educate parents that their own parenting styles have impacts on their children? Miss Faith Marshall Harris. Well, I think that is a given. I think that we that's recognized. In fact. Um, we have NGOs here in Barbados, and I think throughout the Caribbean, who focus a lot on parent education, making precisely that point that um, children will eventually model their own parenting style in the future on what their parents did. And it can be bad and it can be good. And in fact, um, any agent of change that is required is going to be at the level where we change how parents parent in order to get any meaningful change. I want to just say in the last questions, last, last question, I want to mention though that we're recognizing worldwide that adolescents have become the, the great um, agents of change um, in a number of ways. And in, in fact, this, in this, and in this particular, they will merge as the agents of change as well. But the the parenting styles that um, need to be developed can only, I think, be taught. And I think that state parties have an obligation to set up mechanisms in order to train parents who in themselves will model the best behaviors that their children can take on. I think NGOs um, also have a role to play. And in fact, I'm involved in one such in Barbados where we not only attempt to train the parents, but we also interact with adolescents who will, we must acknowledge, become parents fairly soon. And therefore, they've got to start the, the, the education process in that regard. Unfortunately, this is not often accepted in, in the wider community and in some schools. So they don't recognize that adolescents are, are fast reaching that maturation. And I think that we have an obligation to recognize that. Thank you very much, Ms. Faith Marshall Harris. Very important information and ideas. Uh, we have two more questions, uh, and these would be the last two questions. Sorry to you all, but we have to respect time. And the question goes, uh, should youth mental health form part of the training for youth workers? And what is the most practical approach to such training? Yes, um, I, I'll take this question. 
But um, certainly, um, that's something that you can, it should be integrated into um, youth training of um, youth workers. And in fact, there are a lot of standard curriculums that can be utilized. And the World Health Organization has the MH GAP um, program, which really targets um, really promoting mental health in a non specialized era. But there are many different programs um, that have been in place and that are in place that actually um, work through the community and non traditional. Um, and also lay um, persons to provide and support mental health. And in fact, that is where we want to shift our support for mental health from an institutionalized approach to really a community-based approach um, and involving um, all, um, all levels and um, communities in society. And that would also help to decrease some of the stigma and discrimination, which we haven't really talked about much but there's a lot of stigma and discrimination still, and certainly in the Caribbean setting around um, mental health and well-being. And certainly you want to get everybody on board. Um, and there's no one single intervention, but certainly um, as, as far as uh, communities and a grassroots intervention, we need to really involve um, different groups. And then certainly uh, adolescents, and maybe even younger adolescents, adolescents. Uh, in this process. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Davidson. Yeah. Last question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I was just, no, was just, uh, just reinforcing that point and saying that I would like to see our social workers um, trained with an emphasis more on mental wellness um, and instead of our focusing on when it becomes a challenge or, or an illness that I want to yeah, emphasize that they spend more time on the wellness and, and so be preventive in their action. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Clay Marshall Harris. Last question. In light of the negative impact, inability to be with their peers and increased contact with family, etc., brought about by COVID-19, what social activities can you propose that groups can organize keeping in mind social distancing laws? Okay, I, I repeat it. In the light of the negative impact, inability to be with their peers and Unincreased contact with family, etc., brought about by COVID 19, what social activities can you propose that groups can organize keeping in mind social distancing laws? That's a difficult one because I suspect that those protocols change and are different for across many countries. So whereas one country is quite open and therefore they can resume the normal club meetings and gatherings, then in another country they can't. So it's going to be very difficult to pinpoint what um, what we what can be done in a regional way. Daniel, just, uh, you have to yeah. open yeah. Uh, Well, it's very difficult to answer that, that for that reason, but I would say that to have that question means that we have, we need uh, to take time to think about how to respond to that. So uh, I think it's a, a, a nice uh, way to finish this webinar to have this question as a, uh, a challenge that we have to do because we are confirming or affirming in this question that we need to propose places or social activities to, to, have, it, to have it. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, that's the big challenge, right? How to move on and how to bring uh, children and adolescents what they need keeping in mind uh, the sanitary very restrict uh, uh, laws that have been in place in most of the world. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you to the people that joined us uh, from Facebook. Uh, 
you will receive uh, via email the presentations that we have today and you will also receive further information of activities that will be carried out uh, from, uh, from us. Thank you, a very special thank you for the commitment on putting on this webinar series to the CARICOM Secretariat, to the Multinational Office of UNICEF in Barbados, and to the NGO Caribbean Development Foundation. On behalf of Victor Georgi, Director General of the Inter-American Children Institute, we thank you all very much for your presence here today. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank it's a you. pleasure to be here. Bye-bye. Yeah, I'm certainly careful. Thank you. Thanks you for including us in this a webinar. Thank you. Glad for the opportunity to tell people about the rights of the child. Once again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.